And now, I'd like to introduce our special guest, Ms. Anna Marie Sewell. You have been reading her and writing in dialogue with her throughout the week. We've been together since Monday for eight hours every day, um, quite intensive. I should mention that Anna Marie Sewell and I have never met. I don't think no. she has each other. No, no. <laughs> um, uh, I had heard so much about her. Uh, it's been quite a while ago that I contacted you originally. Last year or about this time? Yeah, about a year ago. And as they say in the world of hip hop, she got game. <laughs> Because I asked if she'd be willing to consider a dialogic session. And she said yes. And so we have been, we've emailed, we've only spoken on the phone twice, and once was yesterday. And there's an expression, um, taking a leap of faith. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, the Danish theologian of the mid-1800s, coined that expression, taking a leap of faith. Anna Marie Sewell took a leap of faith and joins us today. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to pass her the mic so that I can get out what we're going to uh, be dialoguing about. Should I say something? Please. Okay, I, di I didn't so much take a leap as uh, I took two A. <laughs> <laughs> the traffic was good. <laughs> and, and it's really nice to be here in Muskogee. I've never been to Muskogee. I've been to Hobima. Oh, a little higher, sorry. I've been to Hobima, but, but it's cool to come to Muskwachis now. You know, I just think that's really cool. And, and, and it's, um, it's always inspiring up in Edmonton to, to hear all the things that people are doing here to, to build this community. And I don't know, I know we're going to get into the work we're going to do, but I just have to say, like as an Aboriginal person, I was listening to the news this morning, and there was this terrible story about a couple of girls in India who got gang raped and murdered and and you know so there's this whole outrageous thing that's going on and it is outrageous and it is terrible and it is a tragedy but I just feel weird doing this I know it's for the recording isn't yeah. it but but I feel weird talking to you like this because I feel like I want to just talk to you like this but sorry I'll remember that we're recording and keep the mic up anyway it's a terrible story and we should feel the pain and hurt and outrage of it, but I thought, what does balanced reporting really mean? How come, you know, how can we accept as, as, as correct that if it bleeds, it leads, and, and anything we are hearing about India, why don't they have a balance there? Why don't they say, here's this terrible thing that happened, and then follow it up with a story that says, oh, and by the way, India is where Vandana Shiva and, and, the, and the village cooperative organizations are leading the fight against Monsanto and the, and the taking away of food rights from people worldwide, you know, or something like that. And I think, oh, that's the same thing we get here. It's, it's so often that you get the terrible story, but where's the balance? And I think that, that we're all working toward making that balance happen, at least here on a local level, and, and I think that's a good thing. I'm glad every time I hear a more balanced view of what our communities are up to, every time I hear good things, you know, because they're always going on. They're always happening. They just don't get as much coverage as the scary, bad, everyone should stay home and be afraid things. And that's not just in our community. It's just everywhere, right? Anyway, that's what I was thinking about and thinking, well, yeah, this isn't, uh, this isn't that. This is people doing something, and I like being part of that. Okay, back to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Well, for accepting our invitation. First, I should mention to you that um, this is officially called Change It Up. So we did change it up. We changed our names. And they decided as a community what they wanted to call themselves, and they decided collectively on universal Cree philosophers. <laughs> so we welcome you to the circle of the universal Cree philosophers. And then each of them gave themselves, because it's an entrepreneurial, it's a, they're going into business for themselves, starting up their own businesses. They gave themselves a brand name. Uh, don't be surprised when you hear Mighty Mouse, Wonder Woman, Amazon, Far Beyond, Knockout, Princess Goddess, 
Samsonite, <laughs> Buffalo Thunder, Sweetie Pie. <laughs> okay, so, so wait a minute. Am I gonna get to Am I gonna get to know who's who's who before we go any further? Because I'm going like, okay, which one of you guys is that princess one? I don't want to know. Well, you're gonna get to know okay. right now. Okay. I'm Naka. Samsonite. CJ. Far Beyond. Wonder Woman. Skinny. Princess Goddess. TML. Sweetie Pie. <laughs> Rock Woman. Buffalo Thunder. Kenji. H-Town Presto. Amazon. Winter Hawk. Homie himself. My name is Wendy. <laughs> I'm Mighty Mouse. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, throughout the week we have been going through the writings of Anna Marie Sewell, uh, Sewell. <laughs> and uh, we are awaiting her brand name as a member, invited guest, inducted into the Universal Cree Philosophers. I bet you she'll come up with one before we're through today. Now, what we did, they did not, uh, they had no idea who was coming. Uh, they didn't know if it was a man, a woman, native, non-native, they had no idea. They didn't know what they were reading. Uh, now is the moment of truth. Everything you read is from her book, Fifth World Drum, published by Frontenac House, which is in Calgary. And um, to keep this as a, a blank slate so that they could write everything that came to mind. I would uh, take, for example, um, and I never called it poetry or poems. I said, these are words. Now the reason I do that is because after 23 years of teaching university, I quickly surmised that if I called something poetry, the student's immediate reaction was, I don't know anything about poetry. I'm not a poet. I don't know how to read a poem. So I, I engaged in what I call demythologizing poetry and just say, here are the words. And there's no title either of the book or of the poem or a name of the author. Um, there's no page number, there is no reference. The words stand or fall on their own. And I invited them sort of in a new kids on the block vein to go step by step through your writing. The first step, read it straight through and write one word about it. Read it a second time straight through and write one sentence about it. Read it a third time straight through and write one paragraph about it. Read it a fourth time straight through and in a stream of consciousness vein, write everything that goes through your mind when you read this. And then read it again and give it a name. I call this, what name would you give to these words, to this piece of writing. Okay, well, let's hear what they keep up. <laughs> okay. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> well, and, and, and do, do I have to pick my own name, or do people give me a name? Like, yeah, you pick, your own. Oh, you pick your own. You pick your own. So, the privilege we have now is you read the words on the page, but now the poet herself will read the words that she created, that she wrote. And we'll begin with what she titled Worm Medicine. Can I preface this? Sure, please. I'll preface this by telling you that the idea for this poem came both from gardening, I love to garden, and um, from a lady called Maria Formolo. I don't know if you guys ever heard of her. She was um, up in Edmonton for a couple of decades working as a dance 
artist and, a, and a, an instructor. And at a time in my life when there was a lot of crap going on, she, she gave these workshops all the time. And I happened to turn up at one of her workshops and she gave me a, an exercise to do. <laughs> I said, okay, you be a worm. And, and she made us all be worms and, and just go through the shit. And, and I thought, oh, that's profound. That's great. Is it great? If you're ever feeling really stressed out, and you can do it with each other now because you all know each other and you, you won't feel embarrassed, but otherwise do it when no one's watching because it looks pretty weird. You go on the floor and just be a worm. Just picture the shit that you're crawling through and make like a worm. Go through it. And then you can understand that, that you, just, you just go through. I felt really good after. I was really relaxed. Uh, keep the birds away. Worm medicine. Earthworm. Indivisible one, feeds on the smallest of things. What is dead, what is rotting, what is unholy and shunned is the food of worms. No glory here and little choice. You take what is given to you and you break it down. Find even the single molecule that is good and make fertilizer of what you don't absolutely need to stay alive to the worm tighter than to the bone. You are honed down to the worm, and above you, the whole sky and world are filled with the beauty that feeds on your tiny work. You move in small, relentless steps, your whole body committed. Whatever shit they dump you in, you move through it. You pass it through you. Glean the good, leave food for flowers, like old Francis of Assisi. You commit your one prayer. Oh, make me a channel of your peace. And it's for Maria. Thank you. Well, we'll now go through step by step how the universal Cree philosophers experienced, without knowing its title, worm medicine. One word surviving. It just reminds me of after it rains. When it comes to my mind at all, I think about a, a worth, or an earthworm on a fish hook. And I used to watch a cartoon back in the day called Earthworm Jim. Stream of consciousness. Now that I think about it, I feel sorry for the worm. And I wonder why worms just come out after it rains like in town streets on the pavement ever since I was a kid. That's all I remember. And when I was a kid, I used to have a game called Earthworm Jim on Super Nintendo. I also asked them to write a tweet, to tweet the piece of writing. I want to do research on a worm. Now I want to know how they even evolve. Where do they come from? The title they gave to your poem, Squirming Around. Because that's all a worm does, is squirm around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And here is another universal Cree philosopher. One word, important. One sentence, you are important. And Mother Nature relies on you. One paragraph. Most people make earthworms sound icky or even scary. But this writing told us how important and how much hard work a worm is. I love earth, the earth and nature. It was really great to read this poem. Wor worms remind me of, of a hardworking bee. Stream of consciousness. consciousness. I'm gonna look for worms when I get home and put them in my garden. And they, wrote, they, wrote, they put a little heart. <laughs> no matter how tough things get, Stay, earthworm, strong. And they wrote a smiley face. <laughs> Remain strong, worm. Their tweet, earthworms are amazing little creatures that leave food for flowers. I name this earthworm. Then I asked them to give their working definition of shit. Here's this Universal Cree philosopher's working definition. Shit is issues that are issues that need to be dealt with. Okay. <laughs> oh. Well, 
Did you hear that? Knockout acknowledged that normally it all remains anonymous and nobody ever says who wrote what, but we invite them to claim their right. So that's, uh, that's it. And I did get worms after. And you did get worms after. <laughs> Way to go, knockout. Well, here's another um, um, universal Cree philosopher. First word that came to mind was ant. One sentence. I take it that an ant or worm has some good in them and work hard at what is given to them. One paragraph, I'm fascinated at what these little creatures can do with what's given to them and make use of everything. Stream of consciousness, the good, <clears throat> the good Lord's little creatures do have a job and they have a purpose in life, like we all have a reason that we exist on this planet Earth. Their tweet to this piece of writing, I figure that these tiny creatures help the whole world go round and round. They have a purpose in life, and they know how to survive. My working definition of shit, I define shit as something that I don't want to do, but I will do it if I have to. Being forced to do something is what I don't like at all. Some jobs are like that, and thinking too much is also a tough job. Now, we, won't get, we won't get to read all of them, uh, Miss Sewell, but here's another, and I'll, I'll stop after this one and invite you to riff on it. It's very informal and open it up for questions. It's a collective conversation. One word, utility. One sentence. It's synonymous with the struggle of life. One paragraph. There is purpose for all God's creatures. There is no job too small for anyone. Even the worms that crawl in the dirt. There is nothing beneath you. We are all equal. Life is about perspective and perseverance. Stream of consciousness, relentless, stuck in the muck, perseverance, faith, blind, blind faith, purpose, unglamorous, utility, useful, necessary, needed, behind the curtain, puppet master, unsung hero, underdog, their tweet, Modesty and humility come to mind when I read the earthworm story. I name this doormat. No matter what the earthworm goes through, it is relentless in its approach, unwavering in its ability, in its, in its ability to perform the most mundane task. My working definition of shit, the most loyal people go through the most bullshit. It is what you are willing to put up with in life. It's the struggle, the stress, and everything in between. So I invite you to riff on that. The struggle, the stress, and everything in between? Shit, what can I say about that, really? Except that that's every day and that's everything that we do and it's also just half of the story. And yeah, it really is. I like what they said about perspective there. That it's all in how you look at things. Is this a good thing? Or is it something that you just have to endure? And you can turn anything into one or the other, you know? And I think a lot about being a troublemaker. I think about that because that's what I do for a living, and, and, <laughs> and I have a lot of fun. Like, I don't make a lot of money, but I have a lot of fun, and that's kind of worth a lot right there. I think that I've always had this idea that that was what my life purpose was, and that made it easy to do it on the one hand, but on the other hand, sometimes I think, what a silly thing to do. What the heck, where did you ever get the idea this is what to do? 
And I think that it helps at times like that to think about worms and, and look around and go, yeah, here's me going, here's what I have to do that's tough, but look at these guys here, you know. They're gonna, are they going to make it across the sidewalk? I don't know. It's a big deal to them, you know, and, and really, we don't know anything about anything. We're just down here at a little level here that from a long way away looks like nothing but a crack, you know. It's a crack in the sidewalk of, of whatever. And that helps. I don't know why that helps. I guess because the other side of that is inside of us there's a, there's a whole universe. I love to think about that too, you know, to a little, to a little piece of, of a little virus inside a cell. You know, we're huge. We're just this huge tumbling universe. There's galaxies all inside us. And Well, which is true. Are we tiny, tiny, tiny or huge, huge, huge? I guess we're both. Uh, makes me think about when I was a kid. Did you ever see that movie, Incredible Journey? Anybody? When I was a kid, it came out the first time. Then they remade it, like, with Martin Short, I think. Was it Martin Short? One of those Canadian comedy guys. I think it was him. Inner Space. Inner Space, yeah. Yeah. And it was the incredible journey when I was a kid. And, boy, we just loved that show. And that's what we would play at school, me and my buddies. We'd pretend we were going inside the body, and we'd, we'd drive around inside the imaginary body all over the schoolyard. Let's go shut an eye! And we'd all, you know, figure out things we could do. And, of course... The, the biggest dare of all would be, would you dare to go down to the butt of this national <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hardly, right? And we'd always try and make it through recess without somebody getting to the, come on, let's all go down to the butt. Oh, man, no, it's not again. <laughs> and, and, and it's a fascinating thing to think, I just don't know what goes on in there. I really don't. But if I don't know what goes on in here, how can I know what's going on out there? It's pretty... Pretty amazing, and, and that kind of, well, that's kind of relaxing. I don't know when to stop. You have to stop me, or I'll just keep talking all day. That's, this is the problem here. Okay. Well, we have the operative principle of the Universal Cree of philo philosopher, Universal Cree philosophers is that there's only one wrong question. That's the unasked question. So we'd like to open it up now for questions Anything you always wanted to ask a poet, but never dared ask. <laughs> um, who would like to start us off here? Yes, TML. Um, Anna, how do you, how much is your book? I would like to purchase a book. No, for real. I'd like to. Uh, I'd like this, to purchase. This is probably, um, giving as a gift to your library here. Um, and I looked around my house. I didn't have any other copies with me. I was like, oh, it brings. I can sell some books. It's a business class. <laughs> but I forgot that I'm still waiting for a little shipment from the distributor. So I'm sorry to tell you. I could offer you a special deal, but I don't have any with me. This 1595 at Audrey's and Greenwood. No, did this Greenwood still exist? U of A bookstore selling and. and there may be a few in the chapters too, I'm not sure. But I'm sorry I don't have any for sale today, just this one to, to, to leave behind. Okay. Um, Thank you for wanting to know. Well, I was w more than willing to purchase one, for real. get started did you just like write your own poems right away like from just being at home or something or in school or did you go to school for like creative writing or how did you get started that's what I'm the question good question because they're starting up their businesses and starting is the first step I don't know when I started I was born this way, and my parents were really 
aware of you look for in your kids what they're born like, you know, and what they what they're gonna do. So I was always making little poems and stories. Uh, I remember, and but there was a problem with that because I remember when I was six years old, I really wasn't very aware of what I was doing, and I wrote this really great song. And then a couple years later, I'm coming home from school, and some buggers on the radio singing my song, that'll be the day. And I'm going, what? I wrote that. I know I did. I was coming off the bus, and this song came in my head, and I wrote it. But of course I didn't, you know. So <laughs> but at first I thought, I'd, I thought I wrote a couple of Gordon Lightfoot songs too, you know. <laughs> As I got older, I started to understand what that was and, and to pick up, instead of just listening to the radio, I just listened to what was going on around me and pick up things and, and use them to actually write stuff down. Uh, I remember writing a poem in this one. I honestly, I did write in grade three, which was about the last train ride, the last passenger train in our territory up around Grand Prairie area. And I was so proud of myself because I used the word slew in a poem, you know. And I thought, hey, slew. And when I look back, I'm still proud of that because I think slews don't get enough poetry about them. In the world stage, that's right. On, you know, I was representing for the slews back when I was seven and eight years old. And I always come back to that and think, you know, you have to stay with what really inspires you when you're a kid. I did study creative writing at university. Um, I did it because it's funny that you mentioned Kierkegaard. It's, that's funny because in my first year of university, I was going to be a visual artist. I love visual art, and I took a, so I took a visual art course. It was great fun, but geez, it was tedious. It's so tedious because we were doing collar blocks and collar wheels, and I'm going, am I not in university? What is this? But I kind of had a crush on the most favorite artist in the class, so I stayed through the whole year. <laughs> And he really liked Soren Kierkegaard, right? And, and uh, I was like, okay, I guess I better study philosophy. And then one day I woke up and went, why would I want to do that for some guy? That doesn't seem like me. Wait a second. I don't want to know about Kierkegaard. What, what's, I had this philosophy class in my time. Told him, I don't want to do that. That's his bag. What am I, what's my bag here? And there was a creative writing class. So I went, ah, oh, that's my bag. Because also I had heard Marilyn Dumont. Uh, doing a thing, I was at a Métis Women's Conference, and that was my first year of university as well, and she got up and read a poem, and I went, hey, that's my bag, wait a minute, we can do that. And, and I always think of, you know that Far Side, they are, the Far Side comics? Yeah, right. there, there's one where there's, there's uh, cowboys in their wagon and there's flaming arrows coming in, and they look at each other and go, hey, can they do that? And I always, I always hold that in mind because my sister had that on her wall. Hey, can they do that? And, and I thought, yeah, that's my motto in life. Hey, find the things where you go, hey, can you do that? Yeah, that's what I do. And I did take creative writing classes and they helped me to understand a lot of different things. A lot of things about where you have to negotiate between what's your voice and what's somebody else's idea of what's a, a currently good voice. And there was a war on when I was in creative writing classes. There was a war against the, an, and, all the little words. They were at war with the little words. And it was sort of the thing, you cut those out. If you see a the, whoosh, whoosh, kill it, right? Yeah. And everybody wanted to take out all those little words. And I thought, after a while, I thought, gee, that's just not fair. Those little words are good, too. And I started sneaking them back in. And, 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 you know, representing for the those. Because <laughs> I thought it wasn't right that they should be stepped on like that. It just it wasn't quite right. And I dropped out of my second year um, writing class, my senior year writing class, for two reasons. One, because I thought, you know, there's only so much at a time that a writer should be able to do of sitting every week in a seminar with the same people and, and sharing stuff. At some point, you've got to open it out. You've got to get out and look at other things and other perspectives. When you know everything that everyone's going to say about your stuff beforehand, time to change it up. So that was one reason. And the other reason was because our professor said to us, us being me and, and my friend Stephen, we were kind of the, the, you know, the lesser than poets. We weren't the favorite poets. We weren't the Jews and poets. We weren't the ones who were readily killing the thaws and coming up with the popular poetry, right? 
Well, Stephen helped me run away to join the theater. And, and in fact, he took up with this troupe of reprobate actors and we started running these little poetry and performance evenings. And we had, and we had a temerity to ask our professor, would you come out and read? We're gonna have a poetry night. Would you come out and read? And he said, oh, I'm afraid I'm at the point where I don't read for free anymore. <laughs> And we looked at each other and went, oh uh, yeah, thanks. And shortly thereafter we dropped out. And, but I didn't think at the time of the, the classic retort was, who pays your salary, dude? <laughs> Hello, we're your students, you know? Without students, you got nothing. Really, as, as, a, as a person who's a teacher, you got to have students. But I just kind of went, yeah, okay, fine, so you stay over there. And I've had my revenge upon that professor many, many, many times <laughs> over. <laughs> Now my revenge is that every time I see him, I understand how uncomfortable he actually is with, with um, public <coughs> performance. And I, and I understand, oh, that's what his real trouble was. He was scared to be shown up as a guy in a, in a different setting. He, he was really afraid because he was so tight in his little setting there. And that's his problem, not our problem. You know, I, I get my revenge by saying to him, hey, hi there, I'm your poet laureate. And uh, Stephen is now a Trillium Award-winning author down in Ontario. I'm going to go see him in a couple of weeks. He's running the uh, Art Bar Poetry Series down there and doing stuff about bees. He did this award-winning ideas thing about bees. If you ever get a chance to look in the old archives of the Ideas program on CBC, there's one about bees. I'm trying to remember the title as we speak, but uh, Stephen Humphrey's the guy's name. And it's a brilliant, brilliant little thing about what bees do. And he is investigating them with a poetic and scientific mind. And he comes to this point where he goes, he's talking to this bee researcher and saying, so what you're telling me from your research is that bees can read? And, and the researcher's going, yeah, they can tell the difference between letters on the page. They, I don't know how they figured that out, but they go through this whole thing, how they figured out that bees could distinguish between these different letters. And, and so he's just turtling away going, bees can read. Well, that changes everything. You know, because we just don't know what they do. Again, we don't know what the rest of the world is up to. And, and that's a long-winded answer to say how I get started. I don't know, just looking at things, listening to things, born this way. Took some instruction to the point where I would say, okay, that's enough of that instruction for me. Now I have to learn it a different way. I probably learned as much by teaching as anything, because I teach uh, youth poetry classes. And those guys are always teaching me because they're so clear about what's important to them. You know, they're so clear about about you open the door for them to stand up and be passionate, they'll jump right up and shout. And, and that always teaches me. I always, also work with people who are um, functionally illiterate, and they're writers nonetheless, and that teaches me a lot too. Because these guys also have a way of cutting down to the worm, you know. They, they don't, they've got no pretensions about who they are, so they've got a lot of really clear things to say. And so I keep learning that way. I've never stopped. I don't know when I'll get started really being a real poet, probably when I'm, I don't know, 70 or something. But uh, that's how it started. Is that, a, is that a good answer? Okay. Two things from what you just said, Ms. Sewell. Um, did you notice her reference, listening, what's important to them is how she learns. And that's a principle we carry over into the marketplace as entrepreneurs, as business people. It's what's important to them. That's real teaching, listening. And that's marketing. And that's entrepreneurial. What's important to them. You also said, just born this way. You use that expression. May I humbly propose that you call yourself Lady Gaga? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, I think that she's a pale imitation of Madonna who, you know. <laughs> so no, and I wouldn't name myself after her either because that's already taken. I'll think of something, but, but thank you. <laughs> well, we'll share with you, uh, Ms. Sewell, um, how some of the other universal Cree philosophers experienced worm medicine. <clears throat> One word, resilience. One sentence, taking the good with the bad, transforming the negative to a positive. One paragraph. It is interesting for the metaphor 
for the earthworm and how people can relate to that because we have all had shit. You were dumped in and can actually have a positive influence from that. Stream of consciousness. I did not like it at first, but after reading a few paragraphs, I started to appreciate it. I didn't like the part of feeds on what is dead and unholy shunned, but I realized that the beauty that can come out of it, what is necessary for growth. It reminded me of gardening and finding an earthworm. I'm glad I put it back in the soil. So appreciating the small things, their tweet, you don't need unnecessary drama or need to hold on to any negativity because you need to hold on to what you absolutely need to survive, to stay alive. Let go of the rest. Their name, uh, the name for this piece of writing, Soil of the Worm, because the soil is the most important, rich nutrient of the land. My working definition of shit, it is a metaphor. Shit, or the soil of the worm, is all that you have learned from, or all the negative or bad stuff you have gone through that can be transformed. I was gonna say, Soil of the Worm. Can I, can I say Soil of the Worm sounds like a great movie. Like I can see the poster, Soil of the Worm, 3D. <laughs> I go see that. <laughs> And here's another uh, Universal Cree philosopher. Incidentally, I should tell you, Ms. Sewell, everything you're hearing, the people who wrote it are right here. They're, it's up to them if they want to say, as Knockout to, had the courage to say, I wrote that. It's, we leave that up to them. What's that? <laughs> well, here's another Universal Cree philosopher. One word, scavenger. One sentence taking whatever is given to you and making beauty out of it. One paragraph. The worm eating whatever there is to feed on, he needs to stay alive in order to survive. He is in his own state of peacefulness. He gets shit on, but still moves forward for, from whatever is in the way. Stream of consciousness. The worm is given whatever is in its way, not being fussy about it. What, whatever he leaves behind, he saves. He takes the ugly and moves on. Nothing bothers him. He is in his own world, carefree and peaceful. Whoever wrote this wants to be like the worm. I name this no care in the world. I named it this because it didn't care what it ate or what it was put through. It was at peace with serenity. My working definition of shit, you can take shit on your job, at home from people you don't know. It's an everyday factor with someone or something and it always seems to be there. Maybe read one more and then invite you to riff on some of these that I read, and then we'll open it up again for conversation. One word, moving, one sentence. You do whatever it takes to keep moving. One paragraph, you do whatever it takes to keep moving forward. You take what is given to you and you break it down step by step moving by small steps, but staying relentless, not giving up, striving, staying committed to where you want to get to, no matter what you push forward. Stream of consciousness, be like an earthworm, makes the best come from the worst. It takes what it can and makes the best out of it. Step by step, it makes something beautiful out of nothing. Keep moving, even if baby steps. Be relentless. Stay committed. 
Don't let nothing stop you. Keep fighting to move forward to where you want to go. No fear. Just do it. You can do it. I'm going to use this earthworm as an example to my midget girl softball team, as an example for them to push forward and not to give up when it gets hard. Their tweet, be like an earthworm, be motivated, be relentless, be committed, be a fighter, be creative, be strong, have no fear, stay confident, be focused, just do it. I name this be like an earthworm. Because the earthworm does not give up, it keeps striving for success to where it wants to go and what it needs. It is so small, yet so powerful for its motivation, its commitment. A worm has everything an entrepreneur needs. My working definition of shit, no organization, no commitment from staff, bad pay, bad hours, and miscommunication. Yeah, that sounds like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I like how they talk about being relentless, and, and I really think a lot about that as a poet, you just have to be relentless. I mean, what a ridiculous thing to do to be a poet. Really? I mean, it's like, in this time and place, it's a little bit ridiculous. It's getting less ridiculous, but I always think about the fact that, you know, I'm not getting my fingernails pulled out <laughs> by death squads, right? I'm not getting marched to the stadium and shot, but in, in South America, for example, that's what they were doing to poets in the 70s and 80s. Take them to the stadium, shoot the buggers. You know, and, and that's been the case all over the world. Anytime there's uh, trouble, the first one's up against the wall. <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, I, you know, I hope it doesn't come to that because I'm really kind of a, uh, uh, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But you have to be relentless in order to love your way through the world too, right? You kind of have to be in a way even more relentless and, and that relentlessness makes me think a lot about um, a lady I know who's a, a little Métis woman passed away this week, a family friend of ours, and you know, she lived in great physical pain for uh, uh, 35 years, um, and, and great other pain too. Her, her boys were killed by a, an impaired driver and they, she broke every bone in her body. Every single bone. They said she'd never live. They said she'd never walk. You know, and she just kept going. And when I, th when I think of that poem, I think of her too. She, you wouldn't know it if you met her, you know, in the, for a lot of her life, you wouldn't know it to look at her, till you look close at her, because for the rest of her life, pieces of glass were coming out of her body. And, uh, and she just lived with excruciating pain every day, but she was so, graceful and I think what a what a pure spirit she was and she died because uh, her lungs failed on her you know she was a heavy smoker too and she said yeah I know that this is gonna cost me but it's what it's it was at the same time it was, in a way it was her sacrament you know she did that to it was her way of keeping herself straight and steady for the work she had to do raising the rest of her family and um, my sister says well I'm sure I'm sure she's happier this way because she was so tiny that if she was gonna, she was on a transplant list, if she was gonna have new lungs, it would mean some kid somewhere died. And she wouldn't want that, you know? Because that would just be too much to, to think about too, right? And I think about people like that and they're all around us. I mean, we all know people like that. They're just, they're just living what you might think is just a little life, just, just not going, they don't get to go out in the big world and do a lot of big things because that's not the hand they get dealt. And you look at those people and go, yeah, but sometimes that lady had more to teach all of us about what grace is than, than any number of, you know, do you take your public figures yapping about it, whatever. She just lived it every day. She'd always, you know, there was always coffee on if you went over. Even when she could barely breathe herself, she's like, the, you know, she'd sort of slap her husband and he'd go make the coffee, <laughs> you know? She, she couldn't take it herself, but she made sure everybody else had some. And that was, that was a sacrament to her, too, to always, when you welcome people, you welcome them as, as if they were holy, as if they were sacred. And she didn't talk about it that way, she just did it, you know? And that, 
I'm glad we started with that poem because because I wanted to to um, recognize that we all know people like that and that that's that's really I think why we do what we do too and what wherever we're able to do you know if we're fortunate and able to be able to start a business or or be a poet or whatever we do it thinking of the honor of the people who don't get to be so lucky too you know we think about okay how can I do something that they would be kind of proud of and and hopefully they would think that what I'm doing is okay because it's it's what they would do if they had the chance you know so that's the the best you can do for them sometimes. Okay, onward. Mm -hmm. Well, let's open it up for questions. The only wrong question is the un unasked question. Wonder Woman. Um, so, first of all, I want to say I really enjoyed reading this piece. Um, and when we read, we're going through it, and we read it, and it was talking about the earthworm and you know being through shit. And that was one of the things that Wendy asked us was our working, our, what was our definition of shit? And so listening to you talk about it kind of made me think, well, what are some of the challenges that you've encountered on your journey and how did you overcome them? That, that's a really good question. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of different challenges. Um, I never know how to, to begin to answer that question. I'm going to stall for a second and say, where'd you get those leggings? Those are so cool. <laughs> cool. Some of the challenges, well for one thing we grew up, my family and me, in a white community and we grew up at a time when if you weren't on reserve and you didn't, you know, and you didn't look like you were, even if you did look like you were native, I had a lot of cousins and friends who who uh, claimed to be French and, and in fact when we came out my mom's Relatives and friends said to her, you know, you should say that he's French because it'll be easier for the kids. And um, they never did. And I'm so eternally grateful because both my mom and my dad turned around and said, oh, fuck you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my mom would never say that. You know, she, I'm sorry. <laughs> she used her own language. My dad would say that. My mom would say, no, no, that's your problem. Why would we lie about what? That's your problem. Not my problem. Not this kid's problem. And in the long term, I'm so grateful for that. But in the short term, it kind of sucked <laughs> because when we were the only like the only color in town, and and we were being very open about it, you know, we learned how to take a lot of uh, confrontation, a lot of people trying to to um, make us sorry that we ever admitted that we were, and and, and well, that didn't really you know didn't work out so well for them in the long run. <laughs> Because it made us a little bit tougher, but I think it was harder on my brothers. Um, and at the same time, a it's a challenge to be... This feels like a first world problem when I say it. It's a challenge to be a stealth Indian, you know? Because I'm half Polish too, right? And that's been a challenge too, to always claim that, to always say, you know what, this is my reality. As a native person, this is the reality that we have. People are people, human beings from all around the world, we get together. It's what we do. And we should be able and proud to reach out across boundaries and that. That's what my parents did and it was very hard for them. Um, very hard. And for me to always remember to, to acknowledge all sides of the equation of who I am and to say, you know, you can have some definition of what's supposed, supposed to be authentic but for me, the biggest challenge has been to go, yeah, you, know, you, can, you can keep that, keep that over there because uh, this is my one life, this is who I am. I don't pretend to be somebody else. I can't pretend to have some other history than the one I do. And the challenge for me is to be always to place that history in the bigger context and to use that to help other people to place their histories too, to say, you know what, any time you're saying there's got to be one history of our people, and that's the accepted version, then you've got a problem because you're categorizing everybody. None of us got the same story, guaranteed. We've all got something that's special, that's, that's our gift, our walk, the way that we are in the world. And so for me, that's been a challenge to say, yes, I am, and this is what it looks like. This is authentically what it looks like. My life is what it looks like. And 
to not be angry about it. You know, I grew up like with, with my face up against the white community, right? And so that we kind of, me and my brothers and sisters, we knew that's the way it would be. But also it's not that there weren't a native community around. They weren't my dad's home community. And as we grew, he told me why he left there. And I noticed that he, they were very careful, my parents, about keeping their daughters off the reserve. And that's because in those days it was kind of a dangerous place, sexually, for girls. And so that was a tricky thing for them to navigate. How do you, how do you be honest, right? Be real about, these are, these are our relatives, these are our family, these are the people that we love, appreciate, and respect. But we know there's this problem going on here. And where, where love and respect doesn't mean you become a victim to a thing that's got to be changed. And, and so I, I can articulate that now, thinking about it, but as a kid I was just kind of like, well, I don't quite, I don't know. I don't know how to navigate that, you know? And one of the things I'm thankful for with that is that my dad would do things like he took, he took us one time to see one of the elders out there and, and um, we had just been working for one of the white families, helping them with some of their ranching stuff. And the next day he took us to see an old lady there and, and she had a, they had just a real, real old resi shack, like with no windows and you know, the can of two week old alpha that she didn't have a fridge for, you know, the whole thing. And she said, now I want you to watch something when you go to her house, you have to understand what real royal people are. This is a royal person. Because when you go to her house, she will give you the best of whatever she has. She's always going to give you her best. And you think about what it means that that's what she does. And these assholes over here, who got so much, they begrudge you a place at the table in the kitchen. Not even the table in the dining room, but they begrudge you a place at the table and a glass of water. The hell is that? And they think they're more important, but they're not. They're down here, and this woman knows what it is to be a real person. So he'd do things like that, and I thought, oh, okay, that's, I understand that, I get that. And at the same time, they, they, you know, they just keep us away from, from the other stuff, because that just can, can um, that take apart your whole life, you know, and you can't, you can't hide from the hard realities of the, of the world, too. But, the challenge is to live up to what the best dream that your ancestors have for you is, you know? And, um, and then not to feel guilty about, the, and it's survivor guilt is what it is, right? You know, you know what our people have been through, so any of us who are alive and well, I don't know, do you guys get that sometimes? Just a feeling sometimes, I shouldn't be okay. <laughs> Right? Do you know what I'm talking about? And that's his challenge, to, to look at that in yourself and go, why the hell shouldn't I be okay? You know what? All those people died and worked real hard and fought and fought and fought. Boy, sooner or later, some of us would better be really okay because otherwise it, it, it's just not worth it, you know? And, and we got to try and be as many of us okay as we can. And, and to say, it's okay to be okay. You know, hey, it's okay, it's okay, we're gonna succeed. And don't feel bad because you succeed. Because I've, I've gone through that, like, feeling guilty about, about success, feeling like you shouldn't have that because, you know, you're not a real Indian if you're doing okay. And, and honestly, what a weird thought that is, right? And, and for years I thought that was out just outside of me coming at me, and it was outside of me coming at me, but I had to sort of rootle around in here and go, oh, no, but that's, that's me. And until I get rid of that part in me that's saying that, I'm always going to be listening for it out there, and I'm always going to hear it. But if I deal with it in here, then it can still go on out there, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to attach to in me, and I don't have to listen to that. I can be broadcasting on a different channel, if you will, the one that says, oh yeah, but I know, I know the royal people. I met that old royal lady in her little house. I know who we are, and we're, we're these people who are really amazing, magnificent people. Yeah, I'm going to try and be like that and try and be like the people who showed the way, you know, as much as possible. And for me, that's a challenge, that and, and, uh, and, and not getting mad at white people. 
because I'm white people too. And, and to take that same spirit of going out into the world and go, oh yeah, these are my relatives too. And as much as they don't know I'm an Indian, and so they tell me all this stuff, and, and you go, oh man, it's okay, now I've got to educate you. Because you were speaking like that because you didn't know one of us was there. I have to give the same honor to my mom's people and my grandma's people on the other side because they're really good people too. And to say it's it's such a challenge all the time to, to take away the equation of us versus them and say, well, what are we all up to here? Where's the royal good in, in each of us? Where's the thing in each of us that I can connect to? You know, we're uh, just... Just if I can be a bit windy. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Maybe like, you know, I don't know, something even bigger, like big tornado or something. <laughs> no, that's only if I drink milk, really. <laughs> so I was sitting in a, in a uh, meeting, two meetings. Can I tell a story? Yeah. Okay, two meetings. The first meeting is um, I'm on the board of the local poetry festival, and they're beautiful people. They're poets, right? Poets are beautiful people. They're not, I said to, we had, we had this tussle, and I said to my one, one good friend who's on that board, who's a, 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 he says, well, you know, I kind of represent for your balding 65-year-old white uh, academics. That's, uh, that, that's what I'm, yeah, like, yeah, I know. And they're not gonna get after you if you do it wrong, really. Well, maybe they will, but what do you care? You got tenure. <laughs> he says, He says to me, well, I didn't realize what, what you, you know, I didn't realize what you go through. I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. It's ridiculous to have this much of a, a struggle with poets. It's not like we're an army, Dawn. And we just cracked up laughing, because can you imagine poets as the army? Like, what would that look like? <laughs> I'm going to write a sonnet on your ass. <laughs> You better look out. I've got my haiku and I'm not afraid to use it, you know. And, and yet, here I was in this position of having to say some really uncomfortable things to a board and realize everyone else at this table is a white Canadian. The second I speak, they're going to get upset in some way. I'm going to make these people uncomfortable. And I thought, well... I gotta do it. And I wrote them all a letter and I put it, I put it on, uh, out as a letter to them, an email letter, because I thought, if I just say it, they're just gonna go like this on me and they're not gonna hear it and we're not gonna get anywhere because they'll just, they'll just leave, they'll just get mad and we'll just stay at the mad space. I'm gonna put it on paper or I'll, uh, on email as it were and then they have to look at it. They can go away and be mad and they can come back and look, it'll still be there. You know, and they can make whatever response they want over and over and over again. It's still going to be there. So I did that, and then I walk into this meeting. And my one friend is sitting on this side of me, so I know he's okay, right? And I see there's one older lady across the way, and I, and I think, no, she's okay. She, she gets it. She's done enough work that she gets it. But there's this woman sitting beside me in this chair who is not part of the board and not part of the conversation, but she's at this meeting because it's that kind of meeting where people are coming. And I feel this thing coming off of her that she's just pissed at me and I'm thinking, oh, they've been talking, <laughs> okay, good. Nobody's writing back to me, but I know they've been talking because she's already pissed off at me and nobody's offering me coffee. And another board member comes in and, and the president goes, oh, the do you want a cup of coffee? And I looked at her and went, you know, she says this to the other person, I said, you know, I didn't even wait for you to ask me, but I can tell you because I went and checked for myself, it's not ready yet. <laughs> and just like that, just, like, oh, don't be a bitch with me, I'll be a bitch with you. <laughs> and, and we had this very uncomfortable meeting in, in, in which I had to say to, to the president, who was trying in her mealy mouth way to get me to quit, I said, no, I'm not going to quit, I'm used to being uncomfortable. <laughs> I've been uncomfortable in white society my whole life. I'm all right with it. I'm down with that. That's okay. Because I'm uncomfortable in native society too, you know, really. I'm just uncomfortable everywhere and I'm, I'm fine with that. It's like, I'll just spread right out and be uncomfortable. I'm okay. I'm sorry for you that you have to share some of it, but that's why I did that. I said, well, why didn't you just sit and talk with me personally? 
about these issues that you had about, you know, the outreach to the native community not going as well as it should have. I said, because I wanted to share the pain. I wanted to make sure everybody talked about it. Because what happens is, I'm the color on the board, and you know that, so you don't even think about the fact that you think I'm going to take care of it. And the rest of the community doesn't even think about it, like the, I'm talking the native community, they don't even think twice about it. They're going to come to me and give me shit for how well we're not doing. And I'm thinking, how come I'm getting pinched from both sides? I don't like that. I'm going to share the pain. I'm going to say, hey, you know what? You, you people who are bitching at me from our community, go bitch to them. Because we're a team, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not, you know, not on this team just because of my heritage. I'm here because I'm a writer. If you've got a problem, we have to have a problem all together. And, 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 and you know, it was a long, hard, grueling meeting. There were tears. People shouted. It was kind of uncomfortable. But at the end of that meeting, just about everybody at the table came over and hugged me and said, now I get it. I understand. I get it. Let's do better. And I'm like, okay, let's do better. That's exactly it. Let's do better together. A couple days later, I went to a meeting of Wichitawin, the arts and culture circle in the city there, and I walked into the room and I went, oh, oh, I'm comfortable. <laughs> and, and, and I had a comfortable time, and I thought, oh, yeah, okay, I was only kidding, I'm not always uncomfortable. This is what it feels like to be comfortable, because it's all um, Aboriginal artists who understand what it is to be an Aboriginal artist working in the mainstream. We're all talking about how we work vis-a-vis -vis the multicultural mainstream. We're all talking about that in different ways. So we're not going on about it because we don't have to talk about it. We're all just living it. We're talking about what we're doing. And we're just saying, hey, I'm doing this. You want to be in on that? I'm doing this. You want to be in on that? Yeah. And we kind of had a lot of fun. And, and I'll end this story about the challenges with one remarkable thing that happened there. The chairman, possibly because I like to yap, <laughs> comes over to me at the beginning of the meeting. To my surprise, she gives me the tobacco and says, would you do the prayer? And I'm like, hey, do, 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 do. okay, okay well, sure. Because sure. <laughs> you, if you're a performance poet, you have to look cool all the time. I'm like, yeah, I said, as if I knew. I said, I'm like, sure, okay, I'll do that, okay. You know, and who can't pray, right? You need to think of something to pray about, and there's lots to pray about. But being, in, for me, it always comes back to we're all in the big ceremony. Whenever it gets down, I'm like, look at, we made the team. We're alive, right? You may not make the basketball team. You may not be invited to sit in this chair or that chair or be with these people, but you made the team. You're alive as a human being on Earth. That's got to count for something because that's a pretty big deal, and. So I always start with, thanks for that. And, and at the end of that meeting, I was walking out with a person I know, but also with one of the people I didn't know. And we got to talking and, and you know, she'd just come out from Ontario. I said, oh, Ontario, ha, 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 we must be cousins. And she, where are you from? And she says, well, I'm from Kitigansibi. You know, just, uh, she looks at us. I'm going like this and she goes, it's right outside Sault Ste. Marie, because she thinks the look on my face is because I've never heard of this place. I'm like, really? Really? That's that. You're my cousin. <laughs> That's my dad's reserve. She said, "Yeah, my uh, grandpa was Dan Pine." I'm like, "No!" And I started crying. And I just give her a hug. I said, "Oh my God, your grandpa saved my dad's life. I owe you my life, basically, <laughs> because he was the guy. He was the the chief at that time, and he ran these camps, these winter camps. And my dad, when he was 12, left." with his dog and went into the bush to find Dan Pine's camp. And, and that saved his life from what was going on in his life at that time. And, and he never talked too much about it other than to say that was the thing. And that that taught him what he had to do in life. And he was given his instructions at that time about where to go and what to do. And I have been spending all spring thinking about that, going, how will I ever get in touch? I don't know his family. I'm not from there, you know, I didn't. Gee, I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to have to go all the way over there and try and say, can I find someone who knows this story? And poof, how lucky am I? Here comes my cousin. She happened to move to town and, and, and she said, yeah, I'm his granddaughter. I'm like, oh my God, well, we got, I got some questions for you. And the challenge is to accept that too, to accept that and just go, okay, that's really the way it works. There's a time for healing, and, and when that time is, is coming to you, don't get scared of it, don't back away from it. Jump up and, and see what you can do with that. There, long answer, eh? <laughs> well, we've been talking throughout the week that 
that each person is a natural born storyteller. And I have to say, you certainly fit the bill, Ms. Sewell. It's amazing to listen to what you're sharing with us it's spontaneously. None of this is scripted. None of this has been programmed. None of it has been scheduled. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. And you made a comment um, that you were happy that we began with this poem. I should let you know that this poem <laughs> proved so evocative for every single member of the Universal Cree philosophers. Um, it was obvious to begin there because everybody related to this poem. So I'll share with you a little more and open it up again for questions. Here's another Universal Cree philosopher writing in dialogue with worm medicine. One word, purpose. One sentence. The earthworm, so tiny, unnoticed, yet so essential to the life cycle. It serves a purpose. How much more so for me and the purpose that I serve? One paragraph. I love the poem about the earthworm. It reminds me about my childhood, my life, and the shit I've been through, and that despite the tough times, they served a purpose. Those difficult times that I survived and disposed of made me, shaped me, molded me into the person I am today. I've gleaned the good, my good. Hi, hi. Thank you in Cree. Stream of consciousness. An earthworm feeds, lives in dirt and rotting things, yet they clean the soil for us, for our gardens and the beautiful grass, greens and flowers grow because of it. How much more so the struggles and obstacles that we face we're not worms. We're so much more complex as a human race. And the struggles we face make beautiful outcomes and people and experiences based on our reaction to those events. Just as a small earthworm serves a purpose, how much more so do you, I, we, and our experiences. They named this the earthworm because it's perfect in the description of the earthworm or character alone. So simple, yet serves such a great purpose to our beautiful earth. <clears throat> my working definition of shit, my definition of shit isn't so much crap or feces as it is about abuse and suffering. You can even call it trials and tribulation. But it entails going through a process with great difficulties. Going through it is tough, but it happens. <laughs> Questions. The only wrong question is the unasked question, and time is going fast now. Who would like to ask a question? Yes. Buffalo Thunder. How long did it take you to do your book there that's on the floor? The compilations you did, how long did it take? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question, actually, because it depends on how you measure it, because it's my first book. Um, you could say I've been writing it up until I started putting it on paper. It's like, um, I like, I like looking at music documentaries. And you know, they, and then it's always like in the music industry, like your first album is, 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 uh, great. And then there's the sophomore album. That's the hard one, right? The follow up. Because, you know, if you've got a contract, you had like 10 years to write your first set. And then you've got to turn out a second set in like a year or something. So 
I don't know how long it took me to write this. When I decided to put it together as a book, I uh, took it as a challenge with a friend of mine one summer to sit down over the course of two months and just root through my papers and write new stuff and come up with a book's worth of stuff over the course of a summer. So I did. I got up every morning at five o'clock and sat at my little desk and just ruffled through stuff until I was too hungry to forget about breakfast. And that was kind of how I did it. it was because it was the only quiet time because my kid was only little. And so I'd get up at that time. And yeah, so about two months to put it together, but a long time before that to start drawing it together. Any other questions? <clears throat> Um, are you from BC? You're from BC? Yeah. Where are you from, Ontario? Yep. Yeah. Well, here, I'll tell you, I'm short answer, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Fredericton, in Miwahik, in uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick. And I was raised in northern Alberta, up in the Peace Country. But my dad is from Kiriganzibin, from Garden River in Ontario. And my mom's from, uh, well, from up north, peace country, but she is uh, from the half of her family that was born here, and the half of them were born in eastern Poland. And then they came over. Uh, when they were under martial law, they came to get away from all of that. And because they were told, hey, there's free land. And as my grandpa always said, well, they told us, hey, there's free land out here, but they didn't tell us there were people living there. And, and by the time he figured that out, that they hadn't been sold a bill of goods, really, he couldn't go back. He had like five, six kids by then, and they didn't come because they were rich and doing well. And he's like, okay, I guess we just make the best of it. Figure it all out. And, and, and you know, in the meanwhile, he's teaching himself to read English by, by working with the newspapers. And, and my mom was, um, when she got old enough, she was the one who taught him, who would read stuff to him, and he would figure out what the heck was going on. Cause, that's how he learned to read back home, was in, in his basement they kept a tutor for three winters. And, and he learned from that. And I always wondered about that story. I thought, well, there's some weird times back there, but that's a long answer to your story. I'm mostly from Alberta, but I was born out in the East. And not because I'm, I am Mi'kmaq by law as well, but that's not why I was born there. I was born there because my dad was in the services and he was stationed at Ormakto. So that's why I ended up born in my family's traditional territory, because my dad was serving in the army. I was going to give it back to him. Who am I going to give this to? Questions? Yes. Winterhawk. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Where does creativity come from with you? How does it spark with you? Do you have a muse? Do you talk to the muse? And how did you get published? Oh, those are great questions. So where does creativity come from? I don't know. I just think it is. Um, there's a comedic writer who is a, an English writer, Terry Pratchett. He writes these, they're fantasy novels, but they're not like really sci-fi-ish. They're just, they're really silly and, and, and satirical novels. And, and a friend of mine got me into his writing. But he has this thing where he talks about creativity as a, in his worldview, there's ideas are flying around all the time like radio waves and when, he, when I read that I thought oh that's it and he, he, he describes these little characters bumbling along and you know the idea will ping into their head and where the, where the stories become troublesome is when someone catches an idea and, and you know the, the narrative verse is going oh, oh you're going to have trouble here because look at the idiot that caught this idea <laughs> because ideas don't care who catches them and I thought, that's about the way it is. In my reality, it's just, it's always, it's, it's like a constant radio signal that if you want, and, and you, know, you tune yourself in, and there it is. Uh, for me, that's the way it is. It's always there. It's, it's, I'm sort of riding in it, like the ocean or something, too. You could put it that way. Um, do I have a moose? I have a moose. Um, I have the moose of inspiration. You know, they have those muses and that, but... It's something my, back in my first year art course when I was in love with that guy, the other reason I stayed was because my prof was really cool. She was this cool old lady. She said, here's the thing. If you're nearsighted, count your blessings. Take your glasses off when you make love and everyone looks beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> she was like this little crabbed up seven-year-old woman. I'm like, 
<laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but it's life wisdom, right? <laughs> but she was so brilliant. And and she she would tease people. She'd walk around and we were trying to draw our stupid color blocks and goes, Are you waiting for the moose of inspiration? And I stole that from her. I thought, yeah, because that's what it's like. I have this moose, I have an imaginary moose that sits on my shoulder and, and comments on what I'm doing, you know? Because I think that's like a moose. Who would have a moose on their shoulder? Why not? <laughs> and and I, try to, I try to imagine that moose, that, that creature, because they're so unlikely. You know, in so many ways, like I, I look for, for unlikely signs like that. And, one time I was driving down the highway on the Red Arrow going to a theater conference with a professor I never had. Who, nonetheless, because this is the kind of guy he was, he noticed me. Um, and he just sort of always kept an eye on me. And I always felt kind of safe. You know, just if he passed through the hall. He's just one of those guys that created that feeling of safety. And I just thought, oh, you know, that's me imagining that. But years later we're colleagues and we're going down the road. And he says, oh, no, I remember you. You know, I remember thinking, oh, you're going to do okay. And I thought... Well, it wasn't just me. He really was keeping an eye on me. And we're talking about life and theater and writing and stuff. And we're going down the road just out here, like, and there's nothing. It's open. It's fields. And there's a little dugout in the middle of this big field of canola. And poof, up comes a moose. And Jim goes, oh, my God, look at that. It's a moose. And it jumps out, and it looks at him, and it comes across, and it just about jumps out the highway, and it turns around and goes, and we laughed for hours, but we still, any time I see him, I said, remember the moose? <laughs> and for me, that's what I think of. I think of moments that sort of pop up out of a slough. You know, there's a slough again, a little moose popping out of the slough. And, and to me, it's anything like that that kind of catches my attention. Um, how I got published was, uh, I just put my book out there. I put it together. I put it together as a manuscript and I looked around for publishers that were taking poetry and I sent it to a couple of places sight unseen not you know not with any hope one way or the other just sent it to them thinking well maybe they'll publish it maybe they won't and then it's really who you know and the work that you do it's other connections that you make because I was uh, on a jury because I've been doing all this work in theater I was on a jury for an arts Thing, and the publisher who published my book was on that jury. And we had such a good time those two days just discussing art and stuff and working together on sorting out other people's grants that I felt like I knew her well enough at the end of that time to go, hey, Rose, can I send you a book? Hey, can I send you a book to look at? And she's like, yeah, yeah, you can send me a book. And I did. And then I forgot. Because um, I had a little, like a little, you know, ankle biting baby at that time and you know how you're you get distracted <laughs> so actually about early may of the next year I'm, i was walking around thinking uh oh did i send it or did i just think i sent it because i could remember putting it in the envelope but i couldn't remember dropping it off at the post office i'm like oh damn i hope i sent that how, and, I, and I'm walking home, literally the day I'm walking home, going, I'm going to have to phone her and go, Rose, did I send you something? Because <laughs> otherwise it's just too embarrassing. You know, you've got to ask. And there was a letter from her saying they'd accepted the book. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm saved from the embarrassment of asking if I actually sent it. Thank God. Yeah, and, and, and they're the best publishers. You could ask for excellent people from that coast. It's a husband and wife team. And they, and they just keep this little publishing company and publish poetry, art books, a little bit of history stuff now. And, and uh, I've talked to a lot of writers. It's kind of a crapshoot who you get as a publisher. And I feel like I really lucked out, really lucked out. But partly that's because uh, I think because uh, the old moose was, was with me there and, and, and letting me just not think about her as, you know, when we were working on that jury, I wasn't thinking to myself, I'm going to score this publisher. I was just thinking, well, here's an interesting person, right? And we were focused on the work, and we just found we were, we were kind of a lot alike in our thinking, or enough alike that I felt like I could center that. So I think that might be something useful for business, too, is you always, you know, you're not always hustling. It's not like you're always on the make, like, what can I get from you? But, but you're always open to seeing that people turn up 
you know, people turn up who are, who are good connections, who you have something to offer them, they have something to offer you. And, and I hope that is kind of a useful kind of answer to it. And I just have to say one other thing. Last night I was talking to a poet friend of mine um, after class. His, I work with his wife, she's my boss, and so we're finishing this class, we're walking out, he's picking her up, and I'm, I'm telling them what I'm going to do, and Randy goes, well, that's remarkable. You mean to say business students are studying poetry? We would never do that. They're way more open-minded than poets. And we stood there looking at each other and went, well, that kind of sucks. <laughs> Because people think of ourselves, when you're a poet, you think, I'm so creative, I'm so open-minded, I am so imaginative. But we're standing and looking at each other, can you imagine a group of poets studying business for a week? And you couldn't tie us into the chairs. <laughs> and, it, and we're both kind of walking away going, we should do that, we gotta do that. <laughs> it's gonna be tough, but we should do it. <laughs> Thank you, that, that was good. Well, believe it or not, the earthworm proved very fertile because there's more and more to share with you. Uh, here's another universal Cree philosopher on worm medicine, without knowing it's worm medicine. One word, universe. One sentence. In the universe, everything has meaning. Everything has purpose. One paragraph, the tiny worm is mighty in his tiny work. His job is small and his contribution is immense. Stream of consciousness. I personally have respect for worms. I'm gardening right now and broke ground in six, six places. Each time I found a worm in the soil, I carefully took it out and deposited it in my new garden bed. I saved my worms from bait last year's fishing and gave them a new home in my garden beds. I understand their contribution to the health of my soil and plants. This understanding is part of my culture and part of the science I understand. I, however, slightly dislike religious scripture and dogma so the quote at the end to me was unnecessary. All good teachings and philosophy is good, even that of humble worms. Worms are cool. Yay, worms! Everything <laughs> deserves its place, even tears and pain. They make us who we are and are a gift. Gifts are cool. Yay, gifts! Their tweet, worms eat shit and fart out happy little flowers. <laughs> Such is the universe. I name this, I name this the gospel of the worm and other shit. <laughs> Why? It is a philosophy that is universal as demonstrated by the lowly worm and, and the, and other shit part just sounds cool. <laughs> oh, okay, can I, can I respond? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just have to say, I'm so glad somebody brought up that bit about the quote at the end, because I thought to myself as I'm reading that, I wonder what that, you know, I wonder about that, because when people are writing stuff as Aboriginal people, and we feel like we have to reference something that people are going to get, I often wonder about that. I think, how much more can we do if we just say, you know, you, you figure out the references. That's not my job. And I wonder if, as a reading, I'm thinking, I wonder if they'll take that that way. And I have to, to tell you why that quote is in there. And it's for two reasons. And, and one of them is because uh, Francis of Assisi was from Italy, and, and so is my friend Maria. She's a, of Italian extraction. And, and uh, so, in a way, it's something I knew would kind of resonate with her. And in another way, because I was raised semi-Catholic, but only semi, um, and I love spiritual life, but the, I don't practice formal religions, and I think one of the challenges of my life is to, to 
take what's good out of the fact that the Catholic Church is such an important presence in our communities today, right? And is so influential. Even when you don't see it there, it's influencing what people are saying and doing. And that's just the way it is. And, and there's something about that, that that I had to acknowledge. And the one thing I always liked was there's this song that there's a little hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace, The Prayer of St. Francis. And when I was a kid, I thought, that's the coolest song. I love the melody. I love the words. I didn't even know who it was, you know. The, and then when I found out later who Francis of Assisi was, I thought, oh, the, of the saints, that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty good, good guy. He decided he would hang out with animals, you know, and and say, look, look at the soul of animals is important too. And and so for his time and his place, um, and for his influence in the in the church that's so influential in our world now, I think that's not bad. And, I feel kind of like a, a, um, like I'm on trend because the Pope picked his name too, right? <laughs> the first Francis, yeah, and you know, so maybe it was like a prophecy. <laughs> no, not even, <laughs> not even. But maybe he was thinking like that too, right? Thinking that you know, if you think about the humble things, maybe it'll help you when you're trying to do big things, and maybe that's the. Maybe that's what that quote's for. I don't even know what it's there for, really, except that maybe we we're, you know, as as far as you might go in your work, the little things will come with you, and maybe it's for that. I don't know. Maybe it's for that for me. As far as I go, wherever that is, the little things are always going to be there. Well, that same universal Cree philosopher also shared their working definition of shit. Here it is. Shit is a word that can mean many things, both negative and positive. For example, those nachos were the shit. Positive meaning, those nachos were awesome. Your breath smells like shit. Negative meaning, your breath smells like feces. Don't give me that shit. Negative meaning, that is unacceptable. <laughs> Overall, it's a very versatile word. So, that word is the shit. Yeah. That, that, was, that was my stuff there. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for allowing us to use your poetry and kind of, you know, pick it apart and, and, you know, dissect it. And, you know, because it really, uh, throughout uh, the course of the seminar kind of helped a lot of people to to express their creativity, right? Um, so I just wanted you to know that that um, you know I'm not sure everybody here you know has a gratitude for that. Um, um, I had a question uh, regarding I guess how or if anybody ever gets really um, agitated or really uncomfortable with with your poetry right because I know it has a lot of uh, um, uh, reference to spirituality and there's reference to politics and there's you know um, or do people ever just get like really confused and be like what the hell is she talking about <laughs> right <laughs> I try to work really hard to make sure that one doesn't happen. More, more so, that's, that's when I'm talking personally to them. <laughs> or when I'm writing them a six-point email, like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Let me put it to you another way. This sucks. <laughs> um, people do get uncomfortable. I've not had people get overtly uncomfortable with the political stuff. I've had them, because I... Cause I, I you know, there's a lot more hard-hitting poets out there than me. I'm a pretty soft-hitting poet, really. And and my old friend Thomas, who's a fiction writer, he said, you know, he works about like being stabbed to death with a butter knife. And, and it's like a long, slow cut with a butter knife. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and he meant that in a good way, right? <laughs> so it tends to... People, you know, if you're cutting them with a butter knife, it takes them a while to come back at you. <laughs> Right? It's not the same as you know, people who go in there and just ba bang And I admire the people who do that too, but... Um, the spiritual thing, definitely people get uncomfortable with that. Um, I was 
kind of feeling all proud and kind of be puffed. That's one of my favorite words, be puffed. It's like it makes me feel like a rice or something. I'd be puffed. Because <laughs> we ate a lot of puff wheat and puff rice when I was a kid, you know. That's my word, I'd be puffed. I was a bit be puffed thinking about um, this review I got for this book, wherever it went to, when it came out. Um, I got reviewed by the Globe and Mail, which apparently is a big deal, right? Because they're the, they're the, it's the Globe and Mail. And the guy was kind of too cool for school, you know? He was just like, I'm, I'm such an edgy, cool writer, and I have to admit, I make spiritual stuff makes me crazy, and you know, there's such an overtly prayerful tone here that I can't quite be comfortable with it. And then he says, you know, it's, it's sort of that rock, trees, clay imagery that, you know, reminds you of Maya Angelou. It's like, he reminds me of Maya Angelou. Oh my God, he compares me to Maya Angelou. And, and so I, I tweeted that when she died. I'm like, because she has such an influence. You talk about influences, you read her work, man. That woman was just, just amazing. And here in my first book review, and some pompous guy is comparing me to her, but he's managing to do it in a way that makes it clear he's trying to put me down. <laughs> And I'm thinking, I'll take it. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you bet. I can, I can be as trite as you like. I'm as trite as Maya, Maya Angelou. Okay, me and her, we're trite because we're talking about spiritual stuff and we're okay with that. Yeah, I'm all right with that. He liked all the stuff that was kind of more gritty and dark, you know, because that's where he was at. I'm like, okay, there's something for everybody. that He could find one you like because it's got some gritty, dark, weird psychological stuff. And that, that, and that makes you happy. And, you know. <laughs> and, and, you'll, um, and he sort of cringed away from it, but he also mentioned it, so I'm okay with that. You know, and sometimes, yeah, people... It's, a, it's an age that we're in where people aren't real comfortable with, with um, joyful stuff with whimsical stuff, uh, and I take it as my sacred duty to represent for the goofy in life, because it's what's, you know, there's plenty of vampire, zombie, end of the world, whatever. It, it's covered, you know, I don't need to talk about that, because it's covered. But what, what I need to be real about is, is what is spiritual and, and soft and small and goofy, because I get a little bit offended when people falsely relate to things, you know. That's really real, that's really dark. As if, if you're honest, you're talking about the dark side. If you're talking about the light side of things, you're probably lying or you're covering stuff up or you poor thing. And I like to say, no, it's a choice. You know, there, there's a lot of challenges we all face in our lives. And um, I feel like, as an Aboriginal poet, I have been sometimes glommed onto by people who would like to save me if I needed saving. And they were hoping I need saving. And they were hoping I've got some trauma that they can help me heal. You know, and they'd, like, they'd really like me to... I find them kind of wearying. <laughs> My same friend from this poetry thing, he sent me a Maya Angelou poem, and it's called Still I Rise. And he sent me that and said, oh, you know, I think she spoke about, this is what you're talking about, how t tedious it is. And you guys know that poem. It's a beautiful poem. She's like, what's your problem? You don't like it because I'm happy? <laughs> what's the matter with you? <laughs> and I think about all the people I know, all the, again, all the good people are like, what's the matter with you? Why can't you be happy? You know, why can't we admit that there's good stuff, too? You know, we have to admit there's bad stuff. And, and then and it's a fine line because you don't want to be covering up stuff that needs fixing. But nor do you want to be covering up stuff that is good, right? You don't be covering, don't be throwing shit on the good at the, at the, for the sake of thinking that you're getting to the, the real truth because the real truth is right here in all of us and it's love. It's love, first of all, always love, right? And, and thank you for, who, whose baby is that? I wasn't looking, is it yours or yours? Thank you for bringing your little person. And I love that the, there's babies around. I mean, that, that's some of the best times is when there's babies in the room, you know, because they always have comments at some point, right? <laughs> they do, but they keep it totally real. They only comment about what's really real. And, and, and that, that, that's so good. 
Right? That is so good. And, and, and to remember that is always a thing that I try to, try to do. So thanks for that question. Yeah? Okay. Who's next? Question. The only wrong question is the unasked question. Yeah, skinny. What was your biggest challenge on becoming an author? That's a big question. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think you mean like having a book published, right? <coughs> okay. So that's a good question because I've, I've been writing all my life, and mostly I write for performance. And I made it a fundamental tenet of my practice at different points. I was very puritanical about, I didn't publish, I perform. And I, I just, like, there's nobody so freaking pompous as a 19-year-old, right? I'm going to prove my oral tradition. I shall perform only as the ancients did. I will speak my words of wisdom and poetry, and you'll either hear them or you won't. Because I'm too good to kill a tree. And it was really, honestly, but it didn't seem like that to me at the time. It was like this, I was this driven, angst-driven little kid going, oh man, the trees are being killed for poetry and, and I'm not, nothing I'm doing is worth it. Whereas it really was coming, I thought, only from the place of humbleness of going, no, I don't got nothing to say that's important enough to waste the paper, right? So I'm just going to work on doing it with my voice, and I'm not going to clutter up the world with crap, right? I'm not going to clutter up the world with books that are that are poisoning the world. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay real. I'm going to do it like this, and that that's the most important thing. And I will testify for that. But at a certain point, I lost my steam about that, and it was a it took me a long time to understand that it was only a one-way street for me. I was being holier than thou about the fact that I wasn't publishing. But put me in a bookstore, I'll buy like a whole bunch of the damn things, right? So I'm consuming, but I'm not producing. And I was just lying to myself, pretending that I was above that. And I kind of, just what a pompous shit I was when I was a little kid. And probably I still am now. You know, 20 years later, I'll go, what a pompous shit you were there. <laughs> But that's okay. You know, that's okay too. We all got to learn through that stuff. So for me, the biggest challenge was really that was overcoming the thought that I was letting down some higher vision of myself by making a book. And what did it for me was I was starting to get older and go, yeah, but shit, I'm tired of, of one, I buy books and I read them and I like them and I love them. I'm tired of not participating in a thing that I have to admit I love. And I was tired of uh, not being taken seriously as a writer because people don't see. It's changed a lot in the time since then with, with all this uh, slam poetry and spoken word stuff. Really the scene has changed, right? But at that time, you really didn't get taken seriously if it wasn't committed to a book, right? Everyone was just saying, yeah, but, but when are you gonna become a real writer? And I was going, well, I already am, and I'm going to make you see that. I'm going to make you see that with the power of my voice and the power of my words. And one day I was like, oh, fuck, get a book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, have some product. Just do it. You're writing this damn stuff down anyway. You know, put it out there. But just make sure it's really well edited so you can say, well, some trees did not die in vain. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make it worth something, because you're eating the food anyway. And it's like, it's like, if you abstain from participating in life in any way, you have to ask yourself, why am I really holding back from doing that? Is it because I think I'm too good for it? Or is it because I'm afraid that I don't have what it takes to do that in a meaningful way? And often you find a thing that you hold back for, that's where you should be. That's, that's where you should be contributing, because you've got a real, real hunger for it. You have a real sense of what would be good enough, you know? And then you have to just strive for it. Um, I was very, very humbled that there was nice spirit beads in my book. There's some little editorial er errors, even though they've got the, the best editor in Canada, David Scholar, amazing editor. He's like, ah, there's gonna be a couple errors. But um, I said, well, but, but, but people will see them. We found that there were three errors. And he said, nah, 
I'll tell you what. After our little opening book tour, I'll buy you, know, I'll buy you a beer. I'll buy you a beer. I bet you nobody, is, we're big gamblers. <laughs> I bet you nobody notices them, and he was right. Nobody's noticed them yet. It's just me and him that know. No, it's kind of humbling because it means that they weren't reading this. You know, they're not poring over it. Um, and I'm glad you guys haven't mentioned them either, because you're not reading from the book. You're reading from the excerpts. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. I'm not going to tell where the mistakes are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'd like to share with you, Ms. Sewell, another universal Cree philosopher. Uh, this truly, this warm medicine proved truly fertile ground. As Far Beyond has pointed out, it, it constituted a catalyst for creative thinking and expression. Here's an, another universal Cree philosopher, a different person. One word, scraps. One sentence, the bottom of the food chain. One paragraph. This poem reminds me of the bottom of the food chain. I feel like the poem wants me to feel sorry for the worm at first. But then the worm seems like it's a small, powerful being who can get through any type of shit the world throws at it throughout its whole life. Stream of consciousness. The worm at first may seem like it ain't shit because it's at the bottom of the food chain. In reality, everybody should look up to the worm and not down on it because the worm is needed in our world. Without the worm, we would have no flowers. Nothing that is thrown away will be digested by the worm, so it'll remain in the earth. Metaphorically, we can learn from the worm that whatever shit life throws at us, we can rise above it by getting through and using that shit to put beauty back into the world, namely flowers. Tweet, they make a small thing seem so big. If you think your life is shitty, just read this poem. And maybe your brand name will change to Big Worm. <laughs> I name this Big Worm. <laughs> because the worm is small, but such a big part of life and the food chain. My working definition of Shit, meaningless, situations, nothing, nonsense, a swear word, poop. Would you like to comment on that, Ms. Sewell? Okay, can, can I have that name? Can I be Big Worm? <laughs> I knew I'd hear it, that's my, that, or Biggish, I'd like to be Biggish Worm. Cause I'm, not, I'm not big yet, but Biggish. Big, aspiring to Wormwood. No, Biggish Worm, there you go, that's my name, Biggish Worm. Thank you for that. Oh, I got a name. <laughs> Again, I'd like to reiterate, uh, Miss oh, Biggish Worm, <laughs> that the, the Universal Cree philosopher who wrote that is right here in front of you. But we're going to bring Big Worm, Worm Medicine, to a conclusion by sharing one last Universal Cree philosopher. One sentence, the earthworm is invisible work. One paragraph, the earthworm knows its role and responsibilities and is built to do this work without end, tireless, rewardless, smallest, and purposeful, the earthworm toils and tethers its eternal commitment to dig in whatever is home, whatever is work, and it does its job every little bit. Thankless beauty. That expression struck me, thankless beauty. Stream of consciousness, 
plunder in purposefulness, robotic, resolute work, whatever before befalls, be, behold, cannot become undone. It is why earthworms are created. Build a mountain, build a planet, timeless, relentless, regardless, the job is all done. No breaks, no aches, skip the pancakes, get to work, work forever, undone, not earthworm, uh, stomp and chomp through everything till work more undone, a drone from an ancient kingdom buries all that has come. Tweet, the earthworm is one relentless machine built for a purpose, built doubtless, can go through everything day in and day out, swithering delight. Another expression that swithering delight. I named this piece of writing bone marrow. Worms are tedious. Oh, there's that word. Worms are tedious, tactful, busy little things. They are the dots and the T's of daily things. Backup toilet is no excuse. Go through it until the job is done. My working definition of shit is when work, commitment, discipline, all falls apart when I choose to quit at whatever I've agreed and committed to. It matters to the evolution of personal success, work myself to success and beyond. If I want better, I have to do better. Wow, I want to say thank you. And I feel like I neglected to say from the outset, thank you. I like to try and start, if I'm performing, I know always to start by saying thank you. But um, thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you for doing this. Thank you for hosting um, this dialogic. Thank you for doing these things. Thank you guys for being willing to take this on, and thank you for looking at my work. I, um, when you write, you write with a hope, or I write with a hope that lots of people will get something useful out of it. I don't want to be writing just for um, people who will cut out the thes or whatever. I don't want to be writing for the trendy, for the, the fashion of the moment. I want to write stuff that the people that I walk with and look up to and love are going to go, hey, there's something useful in that. And my favorite thing as a poet is when I go to readings and there's always some person's been dragged by someone else there. And those people find me and they say, like my best friend's hubby said one time, yeah, I don't really like poetry, but your stuff's okay. And I think that's the best review I've ever got. <laughs> okay. Because it, it's, it, it should be relevant you know, to, to, to the people that you walk among. If you're going to express stuff as a poet, that's my greatest hope is that people go, oh, yeah, that's all right, that's relevant, I can get something out of that. Because then I'm, I'm connecting to something that's important to all of us. And, not just telling you about the glory of me, which is what I get to do right now. And then, and that's pretty weird. I was thinking it, when he said, well, they'll be looking at your work for eight hours a day for five days. I'm like, but professor, I don't even do that. What the heck? <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> that's a lot of attention. I don't know. It's going to be weird. But, but thank you. And thank you for making it really comfortable and easy so far. Okay, let's get into the tough stuff. Well, before we get into the tough stuff, we're going to have lunch. You're all invited.